Dear participants, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this FAO Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. My name is Dominique Burgeon, and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I will moderate today's event. This is the fourth Geneva Agricultural Trade Talk event of 2022, and today's event is co-organized with the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. Our objective is to share information on exciting and timely topics at the intersection of trade and fisheries. We have a series of events planned throughout the year. I would like to thank you for taking the time to attend our meeting today, given this very busy time in, Gene in the Geneva agenda. We greatly appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. Before starting our event, allow me to share the usual details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. You are invited to update your name and organization by clicking on the dots that appear in the right hand corner of the box where your own personal video stream appears and selecting rename. This webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our website along with the various related resources relevant to this session and the others we have as part of this uh, trade talks uh, series. The event is scheduled to last for about one hour, one hour and a half. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for comments and intervention. If you wish to intervene, please use the Q&A module, not the chat box. Kindly state your name and organization or institution, and we'll try to accommodate as many requests as possible. That's all for the housekeeping, and I would now like to take a few uh, moments to present FAO's work uh, on and today's topic, as well as our speaker. As I'm sure you know, FAO supports member efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence and analyse, analysis, uh, providing capacity development and facilitating a neutral dialogue. In this spirit, the FAO in Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks are based on an approach which we call the three I's, informal, interactive and inspirational. Today's topic is on illegal, unreported and unregulated IUU fishing. This topic is indeed very timely. IUU fishing remains one of the greatest threat to marine ecosystems due to its potent ability to undermine national and regional efforts to manage fisheries sustainably, as well as endeavors to conserve marine biodiversity. IUU fishing exploits weak management regimes, in particular those of developing countries lacking the capacity and resource for, the, for effective monitoring, control, and surveillance. IUU fishing is found in all types and dimension of fisheries. It occurs both on the high seas and in areas within national jurisdiction. It concerns all aspects and stages of the capture and utilization of fish and it may sometimes be associated with organized crimes. Fisheries resources available to bona fide fishers are removed by IUU fishing, which can lead to the collapse of local fisheries, with small-scale fisheries in developing countries proving, therefore, particularly vulnerable. Products derived from IUU fishing can find their way into overseas trade market, thus throttling local food supply. IUU uh, fishing therefore threatens livelihoods, exacerbate poverty, and augments food insecurity. We are very fortunate this afternoon to have some of the world's leading experts on this issue with us. Dr. Mathieu Camilleri joined FAO in, 20, in 2007 and is a senior fisheries officer, leading the fisheries global and regional processes team. He is responsible for the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries and other international fisheries instruments, especially those aiming to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Mathieu served as technical secretary for the FAO technical consultations, which adopted the international voluntary guidance for flag state performance and voluntary guidelines for the marking of fishing gears. He also serves as Technical Secretary for the meeting of the parties to the 2009 FAO Agreement on Port State Measures, 
prior to working for FAO, Matthew served as consultant to the Maltese government on fisheries management and as head of the Malta Center for Fisheries Science. Matthew graduated in fisheries sciences and ocean science from the University of Plymouth, UK, where he went on to obtain a PhD in fisheries management. Definitely a key player and speaker for today's discussion, together, of course, with our two other main speakers. Second one being Miss Alice Tipping, who is the lead sustainable trade in fisheries subsidies at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. She has designed and led highly respected programs of research and policy dialogues on trade and environment issues, particularly on fisheries subsidies. Previously, she works as, as program manager, environment and natural resources for the International Center for Trade and Sustainable uh, Development, ICTSD. She has also been a policy advisor to the New Zealand Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva, second secretary and legal uh, advisor to New Zealand Permanent Mission to the World Trade Organization and policy advisor and legal advisor at the New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Alice has a Master of Philosophy in International Relations from Cambridge University, UK, and Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Commerce and Administration from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Finally, we have Mr. Daniel Vosses, who has been representing the fishing industry for a decade at Europesh. Since 2016, he has been its managing director. Before that, Daniel worked for the Fisheries Committee of the European Parliament. Daniel is an alternate member and expert in the European Economic and Social Committee for the period 2020-2025. He's a member of several EU fisheries advisory councils and was recently elected vice chair of WG5 of the Long Distance Advisory Council. Daniel has a law degree from the University of Santiago de Compostela a master's degree in European studies and a postgraduate degree in international maritime transport. Following the presentation by our distinguished speak, uh, experts, His Excellency Professor Mohamedou uh, Ka, the permanent representative of the Gambia to the WTO, will share some of his views on these topics with us. We'll now hear from our colleague Matthew, as mentioned uh, earlier. Please note, Please post any question you may have in the Q&A module. We'll pass them to the, the speakers towards the end of this event. Thank you very much. And Mathieu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dominique. Um, I will now share my screen. Um, I trust you can see the presentation. Yes, but better if you if you play I'll open it up, yes. full screen. Yes. yes, that's better. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Okay. So um, a lot has already been said by Dominic in his opening statement about um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And I just would like to um, stop a moment without going into too much detail about what constitutes illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. All I can say um, to, in a nutshell is that conducting illegal unreported and unregulated fishing means that you're doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing to achieve sustainable fisheries. And Another thing that I would like to mention here is that very often IUU fishing is 
just condensed and referred to as illegal fishing. It is important to note that the, there are these three components, I, U, and U. Sometimes unreported and unregulated fishing are more of a problem than illegal fishing. So it is important to recognize that it's not only about uh, going against the, the rules and regulations that is conducting illegal fishing, but it is equally a problem if you have areas uh, of, of the ocean which are not regulated, there are no rules, uh, and therefore no rules to be broken, uh, no management plans, um, and that of course leads to uh, unsus unsustainable uh, situation. Not reporting fishing activities, not uh, or under-reporting or misreporting is equally of a problem because uh, the, uh, the extraction uh, of resources from the sea needs to be known in order to, um, to come up with a sound management plan for the sustainability of fisheries. So these are three components that need to be uh, addressed. Are you fishing is not uh, only about those large uh, vessels maybe operating uh, in, a, in an organized um, manner uh, on the high seas and venturing into the exclusive economic zones of, of countries, but it also includes the smallest uh, canoe operating just off the coast of a country. So um, as referred to by Dominic in his opening statement, uh, it's found in all types and sizes of fisheries. It affects biodiversity, it affects the environment, but more importantly, you know, threatens the livelihoods of those that depend on fisheries, and of course, exacerbates malnutrition, poverty, and food insecurity. Now, clearly, uh, these uh, are you fishing? Therefore, it is um, so destructful that it is important that we do not have anything in place that supports IU fishing. And hence, therefore, this is why the discussions on the uh, elimination of subsidies that in either directly or indirectly support IU fishing uh, is important. Now, internationally, how, is, um, uh, how, how do we address IU fishing? Well, uh, over the years, ever since the United Nations Law of the Sea was uh, adopted. A number of other binding agreements and voluntary instruments have been developed. And um, just to name uh, the ones up on the screen there, those are the, one, the ones that have uh, either completely focused on combating IU fishing or, has, or have provisions that uh, are relevant for combating IU fishing. So on the Law of the Sea, the Compliance Agreement, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, the International Plan of Action to Combat IU Fishing, the Port State Measures Agreement, Voluntary Guidelines for Flag State Performance, Catch Documentation Schemes, Marking of Fishing Gear, and you see to the right of the screen uh, that gray box with the dotted line uh, that refers to the Voluntary Guidelines on Transshipment. Later this month in FAO, um, a technical consultation is being convened to negotiate a new international instrument which will regulate transshipment. Now, if states were to fulfill those minimum standards that have been defined in those international instruments, then we will not be talking about IU fishing. Those instruments specify the flag state responsibility where flag states essentially need to uh, monitor and control uh, the vessels that they license. Port states, which have um, the obligation to ensure that they are not allowing foreign vessels engaging in IU fishing from entering and using their ports. Coastal states who have the obligation to have sustainable management plans in their waters and to monitor, control, and survey their waters to make sure that uh, all vessels operating there are uh, behaving. And market states have the obligation to ensure that they are not trading in fish derived from IUU fishing. So the writing is there. The problem, of course, is the implementation of those minimum standards. 
Now, at regional level, regional fishery bodies uh, have taken on board those minimum international standards, but also expanded, sometimes putting in even more stringent measures at regional level to address the specificities at regional level. The UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, well, there are two targets that refer directly to uh, IU fishing, target 14.4 and target 14.6. As you can see, we've gone over the, the target there by 2020. There is uh, quite a lot of progress that has been made, uh, as we, we can see from um, this, uh, this slide here. So indicator 14.6.1 um, deals with the, the progress, the degree of implementation of uh, these instruments that I have referred to, um, the, the degree of implementation by each of the states. Of course, this is based on a self-assessment, um, a methodology that has been um, uh, developed by FAO as the uh, custodian agency for this uh, indicator. But in a nutshell, what we're seeing here is that at global level, out of a score from one to five, uh, the implementation of these instruments is four out of five. Of course, one can note that the least developed countries are faring um, less well with a score of three uh, over five. Small island developing states um, have uh, registered an improvement in the implementation of these instruments, but what uh, the, the message to take from this is that, and you can see that it varies between one region and another, implementation still is a problem for uh, a number of reasons, which I will uh, refer to later on. Focusing on the agreement on port state measures, this is a, a binding agreement, the most recent agreement um, adopted in 2009 and which came into force in 2016. Uh, and the, the rate of adherence to this agreement has been the, the, the highest out of all the ocean related instruments. There are 70 parties that includes the EU. Uh, so it's nearing uh, almost a hundred countries around the world that are bound by this agreement. I won't go into detail because we don't have much time and I would like to leave space, of course, for questions. But essentially, this is a, a slide that um, summarizes what the Port State Measures Agreement um, aims to do. It, uh, it is essentially uh, a process whereby the port state, on the basis of information provided by the vessel, provided by the flag state, and any other information that it, it can receive, from coastal states through the RFMOs, et cetera, the port state decides whether to allow entry into port or to deny entry. When it is in port, the port state also, based on a risk assessment, decides whether to further inspect the vessel or otherwise. At any point, if IU fishing is detected during the uh, inspection, then there is a denial of use of port. So in this way, um, you know, the, the Port State Measures Agreement is based on the, the fact that vessels cannot remain out at sea forever. They need to go into a port, even just to refuel, to change crew, for whatever reason, not only to offload their catches. And therefore, if uh, port states deny entry, deny use of ports to vessels that are behaving badly, then uh, there's not going to be an incentive for these vessels to continue to operate that way. The more countries that close their ports to vessels engaging in IU fishing, the more uh, it's going to be difficult for them to continue to operate. Providing subsidies will just help those, those vessels continue to survive uh, because they can spend more time trying to look for a port that will accept them in. So there is not one silver bullet to eliminate IU fishing. We have a toolbox, there are many um, um, tools available, and it is important that uh, the, the regulation on subsidies comes to a conclusion as soon as possible, because that will be an additional tool in the toolbox to combat our efficient. The other message I want to um, put forward here is that the Port State Measures Agreement, in fact, is not only about detecting 
and, in, and investigating, detecting IU phishing, either prior to entry or during the inspection, but also taking action, action in denying either entry or use of port, and also taking other action against that person. And finally, also there is an obligation for the parties to report on the outcome of the inspections and report on any actions taken. And that information, um, then there are another a number of tools that will support this, uh, this process, this detection process, monitoring control surveillance, cache documentation schemes, um, and other records like the, the global record of fishing vessels. But what's important is that all the information that is collected on the inspection and actions taken are shared through a global information exchange system under the PSMA. And that means that every day that passes, the information, the compliance history of vessels that are um, visiting foreign ports continues to increase. Without going into any uh, detail, uh, again, we don't have time for this, but just to say that uh, this is a system that is uh, currently in a pilot phase. Um, it will connect, the global system would connect with any region, existing regional systems. And uh, you know, the availability of information about vessels, about their behavior um, shared at global level will be an extra, um, extra value in combating IU fishing. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I won't go into, into further details, but uh, the, the, just to say that there are two global information exchange systems, one under the Port State Measures Agreement, and the other one is uh, the global record of fishing vessels, which will be uh, connected to this, uh, the PSMA system. Now, regional bodies, I've referred to that uh, earlier on. Uh, there are a huge number of um, fisheries management organizations and other advisory bodies. Um, a lot of the world is covered by these RFMOs. And I just want to mention, uh, and I've referred to this earlier on, that RFMOs take additional uh, measures, conservation management measures, regulations, resolutions, if you want, at regional level. And you can see that, so besides the minimum standards defined in those international instruments, RFMOs have taken a number of, um, a number of measures as well. And you can see that all the ones that were surveyed, the, the 14 RFMOs, all of them require IMO numbers, uh, have measures against IU vessels, um, but at the bottom of the screen, you can see that the, the least popular taken up at regional level are trade related measures, for example, or catch documentation schemes. So it, you can see that at regional level, it's important that such measures, trade related measures to combat IU fishing need to be um, enhanced. Finally, I'd just like to touch on um, capacity development. Um, one of the main reasons why implementation is being is difficult in uh, developing countries is because of the, the lack of capacity uh, to do so. Um, FAO has a global uh, program um, and it focuses on supporting countries to strengthen their policy and legislation, the institution set up and capacity, monitoring control surveillance operation procedures, and supported also by training. Important to note that uh, there isn't focus on one of those uh, areas only having fantastic legislation in place without the uh, monitoring control surveillance and inspection capacity to do what the legislation says is hardly useful and also vice versa it's not only about training inspectors but having the laws in place to support the role of inspectors up to 55 countries have been supported since 2017, uh, and uh, the number of countries continues to, to increase. Finally, uh, I'll uh, refer you to three main websites uh, that uh, FAO maintains, one general one on IU fishing, another one on the post agreement, and another on the global record. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew, for meeting the challenge of such a comprehensive presentation in such a brief peri period of time. And I think you said it all almost in your first 
statement when you say IUU means opposite to achieving sustainable fisheries with the, the three dimensions uh, being equally important with uh, flagging also the importance of a, a comprehensive toolbox. We have many elements and there are current discussion on another element to this toolbox, which is the agreement on, on subsidies. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, let me now move to our second speaker, uh, Alice Tipping from IISD. Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Dominique. Uh, let me just try and share my own screen and make it big for you. Can everyone see that properly? Yes, super. Yes, please. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you uh, to the FAO very much indeed for the invitation to join uh, this important webinar. Let me turn my... Stop subtitles. Voila. Um, well, thank you very much indeed again to the FAO for the invitation to, to join. Um, not everyone in the audience may be aware of who the IISD is. Uh, we are a Canada-based uh, think tank, essentially. We run a lot of different uh, policy and scientific programs uh, based in Canada, but we have a large office here in Geneva, in Switzerland, from where we run a lot of work on trade policy issues, um, in particular, uh, a focus on supporting the negotiations underway at the World Trade Organization on fisheries subsidies, uh, but we also do a lot of work on agricultural subsidy reform and agricultural policy as well, so I think we'll have a lot to talk about with our FAO colleagues. Um, so I've, I've been asked by the organizers to, to help, I guess, to link the discussion uh, on IUU fishing and the various international efforts to prevent it, which Matthew has presented extremely well, uh, and to link that back to negotiations that many of you will be aware of that are underway at the World Trade Organization on a new treaty to discipline subsidies to fisheries. Um, and I see a few names in the list uh, who I recognize from WTO negotiations, so forgive me colleagues, uh, you will know all of this. Um, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to walk through for everyone else uh, the text and the, the mechanics of one particular article in this new treaty, which is Article 3, uh, which deals with rules on subsidies to vessels that have been found to have been engaged in IUU fishing. And I'll talk a little bit about exactly how they might be found to have been engaged in IUU fishing. Um, but just to give you a sense of the context, so Article 3 of this treaty talks about subsidies to IUU fishing, Article 4 talks about subsidies to overfished stocks, so stocks over which there's already a determination that, it's be, that it is in an overfished condition. And Article 5 is a broader collection of rules that is intended to discipline subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and to overfishing more generally. And of course, there's special and differential treatment for developing countries woven in throughout this agreement. Um, and as Matthew rightly said, uh, these negotiations have been underway for many years. Uh, the words overcapacity and overfishing are taken from the very original mandate, uh, which was agreed back in 2001 and then in 2005. Uh, and I couldn't agree with Matthew more uh, when he says that it's really past time to finish these negotiations. And I know that there's an intensive week of discussions planned for next week. Uh, and we're hoping to see... I guess some signs at the end of that week uh, that some of the harder issues have been finalized. Um, one word of perhaps encouragement uh, as I move into Article 3 is that of those three articles that I talked about on IUU, overfished stocks and overcapacity and overfishing, this article is pretty stable. Right? It's what negotiators generally call stabilized. Um, I'll be going through it in some detail because I think it's important for all of us sort of as, as policy makers and, uh, and policy followers to understand the quite delicate technical and diplomatic compromise that's been reached in crafting these rules. Um, and so forgive me if there are a lot of words on the screen, but you'll see as I go through just how carefully some of those words have been chosen. So um, article three, and the basic approach in this article of this draft treaty is that there would be a, pro a prohibition of subsidies that's triggered by a determination of IUU fishing. But in, on the other side, kind of to counterbalance that relatively strict prohibition, the government providing the subsidy gets to decide how long the prohibition lasts. Might be short, might be long, but there is a minimum uh, in the text as well. 
So those of you who know the negotiations well will know this, um, but just to kind of just step you through it. So the basic rule, subsidies are prohibited for vessels or for operators when the vessel or the operator is the subject of an affirmative determination made by a coastal state or a flag state or an RFMO, Matthew was talking about this, when one of those entities makes an affirmative determination that a vessel or an operator has been engaged in IUU fishing in accordance with that state or RFMO's rules, then that is the determination that triggers the prohibition of subsidies. One interesting little point to note is that the subsidy prohibition applies to the same entity that is the subject of the determination, right? And by that, I mean, if the determination applies to an operator of several vessels, the subsidy prohibition also applies to that operator. If it applies to a particular vessel, then the subsidy prohibition only applies to that vessel. So there's designed to be a, a degree of congruence there. So an affirmative determination triggers a subsidy prohibition. Um, I'll get to the, the grace period perhaps when I talk about the next detail. Um, but a determination has to fulfill a number of specific procedural steps. And many of you, those who are in government uh, and who are familiar with fisheries policy will understand why there is a degree of restraint placed in the treaty on the determinations that can be made. Um, and this was essentially the product of tensions and concerns between sort of between nations that have very large fishing fleets and those that have and those that are coastal states. Um, the coastal states involved in the negotiation very much wanted the ability to have determinations trigger a subsidy prohibition. Those members with very large fleets were quite concerned that any kind of determination based on any amount of information or not could trigger the subsidy obligation. So there's a degree of control written into the treaty about what a determination has, how a determination has to be made in order for it to trigger the subsidy provision. So determinations, in particular those made by coastal states, must be based on relevant factual information. Uh, and the coastal state has to provide the flag state of the vessel and the subsidizing member of the vessel, if they know who that is, with a notification, uh, either that the vessel has been detained or that an investigation has been in initiated, information about what the vessel was found doing um, and what the applicable laws were. So an indication of what the problem is and an opportunity for the flag state and the subsidizing member, if you know who it is, to exchange relevant information with the coastal state that can be taken into account in the process of making the determination. So there's an interesting balance right here and a sense that a determination needs to follow a, a degree of due process and they included that word and then took it out because it was a bit too fuzzy. Um, but a degree of understanding about what due process a determination should follow in order for it to trigger an obligation under this agreement. Now, important to note, nothing in this agreement obliges members to make IUU determinations. That is entirely a sovereign decision if you're a flag state or a coastal state, entirely an RFMO decision if it's an RFMO. And nothing in this agreement, including these procedural steps, can be used to obstruct or delay a determination, right? So you can give the flag state an opportunity to provide information, fine, uh, but if they choose not to, that's not a reason to delay making your determination. So again, there are, there are footnotes which help to counterbalance the degree of control, essentially, that coastal states and flag states have. So on the other side, um, assuming that your determination meets all of the procedural steps, it triggers an obligation to withdraw subsidies from the vessel involved. Now the subsidizing member can decide how long that prohibition should last, and they must consider, so this is an obligation, they must consider the nature, gravity, and repetition of the infraction. And so that's an interesting way of ensuring that if it is an extremely serious and perhaps repeated series of offenses, there's an implication that the prohibition should last longer, right? You must consider the gravity and repetition in deciding how long the prohibition lasts. The prohibition also can't be too short, according to the treaty. So it needs to last at least as long as the listing of a vessel lasts or as long as the original sanction remains in place. So essentially, you can see here, there's a careful, multiple, very nuanced degree of 
control established between the coastal state or the flag state or the RFMO who might be establishing the determination and what the subsidizing member can do. Very interesting point here that links back to uh, the points that, that Matthew was making about port states. There was a long discussion in the negotiation about which entities should be allowed to make determinations that would then trigger the subsidy prohibition. And in the end, they ended up with coastal state, as you've seen, or a flag state or an RFMO. Some members argued that port states should be included in the list and should be allowed to make IUU determinations that would trigger a subsidy obligation. Uh, until a number of members pointed out that port states don't make IUU determinations per se. Um, and so this is the point that Matthew was making. I think kind of the orange bubbles on his very good slide said, said everything except IUU determination. <laughs> And so the point here is that what we have instead is a sort of an indication, an obligation, but in a role for port states that's a bit that's similar to, but not exactly the same as the others. So the rule here is that where a port state member of the WTO notifies a subsidizing member that it has clear grounds to believe a vessel in one of its ports has engaged in IUU fishing, the subsidizing member shall give due regard to this information and shall, shall take, but shall take such measures or actions in respect of its subsidies as it deems appropriate. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of a soft connection established in the treaty there. One thing I didn't know, which I just learned from Matthew, is that the implementation of this rule is going to be greatly facilitated, I think, by the Port State Measures Information Exchange System. Because until I knew that that existed, I was not sure exactly how port states were going to communicate with subsidizing members about the information they had. Uh, so I rapidly changed my talking points and I'm now somewhat more, uh, more confident about the impact that this particular rule has had. So I, I, I'm going to stop there. I think I've drawn the links uh, and established how important the IU fishing element is in the Fisheries Subsidies Treaty. Um, I'm leaving in, in email addresses there. Uh, in case anyone else is interested in the negotiations themselves, but I'll leave it there for now um, and would be delighted to take questions. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alice, for presenting so well the, the link, the, the, how IUU fishing is positioned in the draft WTO fishery subsidies agreement. So thank you very much for that. And let's now move to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Daniel Vosses from uh, Europesh. Uh, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'll try to share my PowerPoint. I'm going to enlarge it. I hope you can see it. All right, so I will continue now. So uh, uh, thank you very much to FAO for inviting me to the trade talks on IEU fishing. Um, today, I will be uh, making a presentation from an industry perspective and particularly from a European Union perspective, given that this is the field of my expertise. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Europesh, Europesh is the uh, European organization representing uh, the European fishing industry and is based in Brussels. So before getting into the, uh, into the presentation, I think it's rather useful to show you some facts and figures about uh, European fisheries. So as you may know, the vast majority of our catches take, take place in our own waters in the European Union, but it's also true that around 20% of our catches come from outside our borders and they are landed in, in different countries which are regulated by RFMOs or agreements with, uh, with those third countries. Um, if we look at the market, uh, we see that the European fishing fleet is catching around 4% of the world catch. But it's also true that the European Union is heavily depending on the inputs from third countries. I think nowadays we are actually over the 70% of the fish consumed in the, in the European market comes from abroad. And if we look at the species, uh, we can see that tuna, cod, Salmon and Alaska pollock are the one are the main species consumed in, in our market. So this uh, obviously makes clear that we need the right tools uh, in place, and we are all familiar with the consequences of the IUU. Uh, Mr. Camilleri already referred to the environmental damages, not only to the fish stocks, but also to the governance and to the very scientific assessments 
on which we depend to to give a, to to provide advice and and to to make sound decisions, and also threatening the livelihoods of fishermen. They're facing the loss of market, low prices, job losses, and this is particularly um, worrying in in developing areas with limited capacity uh, to control uh, their own waters. Again, uh, Mr. Camilleri uh, made reference to this, but um, the action from the different states will, uh, will, um, uh, will be different depending on the role that these uh, countries are playing in different situations. So if we look at flag states, obviously they need to regulate their own fishing fleet with uh, licenses, authorizations, tracking devices, et cetera. If we look at the market, uh, when th th then we see that, uh, that it's, uh, it's completely important to have a uh, traceability, full traceability of the of the catches, and that can be done through the catch certification schemes. When we talk about uh, port state control, we have a really good uh, agreement from from FAO that is actually regulating the uh, the activities of foreign vessels when they call the ports in a in a different country. And when we look at the coastal states, obviously they need also need to to regulate and to monitor what's what's going on in the, in the seas that are next to that country. So um, bearing this in mind, we see that, the, uh, that the, uh, we face in global ocean challenges and this required involvement of all the countries and all the stakeholders in the chain. The European Union and other uh, regions and countries, they have led uh, huge progress in tackling IUU fishing, but it is it's obvious that this is a global issue and they cannot fight this, this battle alone. Uh, if we really want to achieve the SDG 14, we need an international commitment and joint action against IUU. And it, uh, it requires the, an action from all the levels of the supply chain, from the catching sector to the, to the consumer and to have an effective system in place to tackle these issues. Uh, in our opinion, as, as industry, uh, we do believe that the post state measures agreement has been a huge step and a milestone in the fight against IEU. Uh, first, because as a legally binding document, and second, because it was widely ratified by the international community. Also, we see that uh, in, in, in some important fishing countries and nations, uh, the, uh, the level of ratification and implementation is low. If we look at the European Union response to IEU fishing, one year before the adoption of the post state measures agreement, the European Union already uh, put in place uh, a complete and holistic system to tackle IUU fishing, which was lately, uh, later complemented by, by, by other legislation, including most recently the management of the external fishing fleets. Uh, the European response to IUU fishing is not just about port access conditions and inspections, which is fundamental to tackle are you efficient? But it's also regulating the market side with a cut certificate scheme, and also is is trying to open a dialogue uh, with uh, with other countries who are not fulfilling uh, their duties uh, to tackle are you efficient? And I think the carding system has has been proved to to be a, a fundamental tool uh, as a driver change of the uh, of the legislation in in the third countries. Uh, before adopting the IUU regulation in the European Union, the European Commission launched an impact assessment and, and they were analyzing the possible impacts of this legislation in the different stakeholders and even uh, national authorities. So as you can see in the slide, you know, for the governments, obviously new legislation will require uh, new uh, resources, financial and human, and also technical uh, assistance and training, etc. When it comes to the European fishing fleets, uh, with the carding system, we we risking uh, losing uh, fishing uh, fishing grounds in third countries. Uh, we also facing higher bureaucracy costs, certification, and and higher penalties, and even the elimination of subsidies uh, to vessels that are engaging in in IUU. When we look at processors and retailers, uh, then we see that in the short term, this led to a concentration of supply in secure sources. Uh, also an increase of, of cost, certification requirements, et cetera. If we look at private labels or private certification schemes, uh, we see in the impact assessment that they are not heavily impacted by the legislation because it's not addressed to, uh, it's, it's addressed to operators and not to consumers. 
and second because we are certifying uh, legality and not sustainability. Uh, on the level of acceptance of the IE regulation, I would say that it's been high uh, by the industry. It is true, as I explained, that uh, the new legislation uh, will come with uh, new requirements, bureaucracy and costs. But we do believe that in the long run, the advantages and the benefits brought about by the new legislation um, is actually uh, benefiting and, and, and welcoming uh, the, the, new, the new standards in, uh, in, in fisheries legislation. And why do we say this? Well, because thanks to these regulations, we can eliminate uh, illegal uh, fishing practices and unfair competition. It's actually benefiting the state of the fish stocks. And finally, it's also uh, benefiting the image of the fishing industry, which, uh, as you may know, in the European Union, we have uh, a lack of uh, generational change and, and attractiveness of the sector. Um, as, as was presented by Mrs. Stephen, uh, this is very much linked to the WTO negotiations on, on fish subsidies. Uh, it is my understanding that, uh, that, that the governments are making huge progress, particularly on the Article 3 that was presented uh, in, the, in the previous presentation. And uh, well, the idea would be, as it was presented, that vessels and operators that are engaging in IU fishing should not longer, or, for, or at least uh, temporarily, uh, not eligible for funding. Uh, in the case of the European Union, this is already the case. Uh, our operators, uh, those who have committed serious infringements, they cannot apply for European funding one year prior to the, to the date of the application and five years after the final, final payment of the, of the subsidy. And even if there are court cases or, or, or cases with, with administration, uh, those authorities, they may decide to actually extend or, or, or even make it permanent, the ban on access to, to, to public aid. Uh, we welcome that the, uh, the determination has to be affirmative and based on a final decision by the flag, coastal or aerofermal authorities that is actually uh, providing our operators with, uh, with more legal security uh, in these cases. And uh, as explained uh, in, the, in the previous uh, presentation, I do think that there's, there's quite a balance now between the competences and the level of involvement of the flag and the coastal states in the determination of the, of the uh, in the termination process. Uh, concerning the scope of the disciplines, and when it comes to the IUU disciplines, we do believe that they have to apply in all the seas and in all the regions, meaning that we cannot have any uh, derogation for territorial seas or any specific countries. Um, otherwise, there will not be a, a level playing field. Uh, but we do understand that for certain countries, they need uh, a certain transition period to adopt and apply the ne necessary legislation to, uh, to implement the WTO disciplines, but also, uh, for instance, the port state uh, measures agreement. But this period should be short and, and, uh, and, and should be useful for these countries to implement the, national, the, the necessary legislation. Uh, what would be uh, the next steps uh, from our point of view? As, as, as fishing industry, we are always promoting the ratification and implementation of the fisheries convention that, as explained by Mr. Camilleri, they are already there, they exist, and they should be ratified and, and implemented by, by all the countries. Uh, we are collaborating and pushing the European Union uh, to use the fisheries agreements and the trade agreements with their countries to tackle IU fishing and to create the, nas the necessary capacity building. Um, we obviously are promoting, uh, not only within the European Union, but outside uh, the, the advanced uh, regulation that we have in the European Union. For instance, the catch certification schemes that are really necessary in RFMOs and in other, in other parts of the, of the world. And the European Union, we are now fully digitizing the system and making sure that is uh, the, the interoperability between the member states of the European Union and the third countries. And for us as a market region uh, for imports, uh, it is uh, fundamental to have uh, better controls on, on the fish that, are, that is coming in our market. As a final uh, slide and ideas, uh, we need to make sure that there's full transparency at traceability also at the uh, fishing, fishing fleet level. And uh, well, this was mentioned already, but for us, it's also fundamental to make a mandatory use of the IMO number to use the right uh, monitoring and reporting tools uh, for fishing, uh, to promote and still support the International Register of Fishing Vessels under FAO, 
to publish licenses and authorizations specifically for the external fleets operating uh, in international waters and in the EEZ of third countries, uh, to strongly regulate, if not ban, transshipments in the, in the high seas. And finally, uh, and, and I think this is a successful story, the interinstitutional cooperation between the different United Nations uh, agencies. Uh, we see, for instance, the working group on IUU between FAO, ILO, and, and IMO, and, and perhaps uh, WGO should at some point uh, join this, uh, this group if it's not been done already. And also the cooperation between uh, the different countries to harmonize controls on IUU to avoid any shift in port access and trade flows. Otherwise, we will have always uh, loopholes that uh, that some operators may uh, get used to uh, get used uh, to um, well to to trade their the, the, the catches. So I thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, indeed, for giving the European uh, perspective on this and, and sharing your views and concerns. And now uh, it is my great pleasure before opening the, the floor and to answer some of the quite many questions that are coming up uh, for the, our panelists. Uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to, F, to uh, His Excellency Professor Mohamedou uh, Ka the permanent representative of the Gambia to the WTO. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us, uh, Excellency, and uh, it would be great if you could share your, your perspective. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of my delegation and, um, uh, and myself, we, we thank you, Mr. Dominic, for organizing this very, very important um, event. I'm actually shuttling from the G77 <laughs> meeting that I just came back uh, moderating um, to, to this uh, a very important um, activity. I, want, I also wish to appreciate the insights that are shared by uh, uh, Dr. Matthew, as well as uh, Alice. Alice, good to see you on the platform, and, and Daniel. Um, uh, it's, it's a big topic and a huge, uh, uh, lots of issues for us uh, uh, countries of the South, especially uh, the Gambia. So um, uh, quite a number of the issues uh, have been touched upon. I will just share some, some uh, uh, very quick perspectives. Um, uh, IUU fishing in my mind uh, is, is, is a significant impediment um, to the achievement of sustainable wall fisheries. This, this, this is crucial, and I think we should all um, uh, take note of that. The other point is uh, the issue of IUU um, goes beyond a country. A country. Uh, is, it has larger implications for regions and for the continent, and, and we have to situate it that way, if we isolate it as a, as a country issue, we miss the point. Um, the fisheries sector uh, undoubtedly has uh, imminent, um, immense potential uh, to contribute to poverty uh, reduction and improvements of livelihoods and socioeconomic benefits. I think we all agree on, on, um, on that. Uh, millions, millions of Africans and, and peoples of the South uh, depend on this sector for their livelihoods and nutrition. So what is at stake for, for us if you situate it in the rising crisis of food security, uh, the, 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 the issue of IUU fishing should actually be escalated on top of global agenda. Um, uh, one of, one of uh, uh, the principles um, or the, one of the principal courses uh, 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 is IUU. Um, uh, because if there was no IUU issues, uh, the risks to food security will not be there. So IUU fishing is a big risk um, that we confront as a continent um, because our fisheries resources are being depleted at rates that we can't keep up and, and affecting 
livelihoods and also causing other externalities that sometimes may not be coupled with fisheries, i.e. migration, i.e. conflicts. Um, uh, uh, so I, I will just anchor that on that. So, so, um, so, so the causes of IUU cannot be viewed from a very technical and simplistic. It has socioeconomic ramifications for our people. Um, the unfortunate uh, reality, which um, some of the presenters uh, have touched on, is that most African members, uh, including the Gambia, lacks the capacity, both human and financial, to monitor and enforcement of compliance of, of our natural resources. All the, all the, the needed to manage IUU and manage the risk, we don't have the capacity. We don't have the infrastructure. Um, we can benefit enormously from the ongoing efforts of FAO in the space of digital um, infrastructure and data infrastructure. For, for, for management and for, for surveillance and for alert, for alert and information sharing. Without data infrastructure, central to national systems and regional systems, uh, all of uh, uh, the capacity efforts will not yield the impact for us to manage and the risk IUU. So it is worthy as we pro proffer um, uh, uh, solutions to revisit the lack of data infrastructure, the lack of digital infrastructure, given um, that emerging technologies that are being used are heavily data dependent and hugely smart. And uh, once we get these things and the training, the issue of the risks around IUU can be mitigated faster and better. In the case of the Gambia, um, we are one of eight countries within the Canary current large um, marine ecosystem, the CCLME, which is one of the most productive upwelling ecosystems to the world that, represent, that are represented by more than uh, a thousand species of fish. So the FAO estimated the IUU fishing cost the CCLMEs, Gambia, Mauritania, Senegal, Guinea, or Guinea-Bissau, uh, from the last figures I've seen, an estimated of close to 2.3 billion per year between 2010 and 2016. The IUU fishing is characterized by activities such as what have been shared with us, illegal transshipment, unauthorized fishing, uh, GAUs and prohibited techniques, excessive and prohibited bycatch, unauthorized or undeclared catches and fishing in prohibited areas or during the prohibited seasons. And we have no mechanism to manage that or to monitor that effectively. And when we do, there are other internal, I would say challenges that are more endemic uh, in some member states, which is compromising of those that are entrusted to monitor and to manage. They, they're easily corruptible, to, to, for a lack of better word. Um, so that's, 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 uh, that's a factor. The biggest challenges my country faces in combating IEU in the absence of a proper monitoring structure such as the National Navy, despite being poorly equipped with resources to cope adequately with the various threats of IUU fishing, was solely responsible for the protection and surveillance of fisheries. And these Navy institutions in quite a number of our countries, including Gambia, do not have the capacity, do not have the resources to manage our waterways and our stock. So efforts should be redirected in terms of how um, we can step up the capabilities and the capacity, both from the human side 
and from smart infrastructure and to create capabilities around data and information infrastructure. To, if we have good data infrastructure, good digital mechanism using emerging technologies, we can mitigate the lack of adequate uh, capacities that will take time to build up. So technology uh, could be a very important catalyst. I, I must say in June, 2021, through the sector support of the European Union Sustainable Fishing Partnership Agreement, the Gambia was able to establish for the first time a fisheries monitoring center. And we're very grateful to the European Union. And we're looking forward for the opportunity for partners and friends of the Gambia to strengthen this uh, uh, FMC, uh, uh, to strengthen and scale it and equip, with, equip it with smart technology to be able to be a national hub that can, that can connect to regional mechanisms and global mechanisms for information sharing. At the national level, um, we're taking steps, albeit very modest one, uh, with very limited tools necessary to combat IUU in, light, in, in line with our international commitments. We have a strong partnership with FAO and we appreciate all the support we continue to get from FAO. Sometimes I wonder without that support, where we will be. So we will continue to work with FAO to strengthen our collaboration and build a sustainable fisheries ecosystem. Here in Geneva, we have opportunity next month. And I'm sure Alice uh, is on top of that. Um, when WTO ministers meet to agree on fisheries subsidies, the fisheries subsidies agreement is quite crucial and will be among other things to eliminate subsidies for IUU fishing. This would be a major, major step in the global fight to combat IUU. It's a collective efforts that we must uh, achieve in this upcoming um, uh, uh, MC12. We also appreciate the continuing intellectual contribution and analytical knowledge sharing that comes from the IISD. Um, your insights, uh, my delegation in particular, find them very useful and helpful to guide us when we engage in an imbalance capacity and knowledge uh, perspective. I think our partners and friends must understand the lack of equity in terms of engagements and negotiations, and also reflect on the inherited uh, mechanisms that were never in favor of protecting our waters or our ocean economics. And now that there is a rise dependency in a large increasing percent of fisheries resources from our waterways, it is important for the negotiations and the engagement not to be a zero sum game, but rather a positive sum game to fix the anomalies and the lack of equity among member states uh, in the South and in the North. The point that uh, Matthew, um, I think it was Matthew's presentation that ended up, uh, our collective efforts and FO, FAO leadership to help us revisit the policy regimes and legislations in our member states and make them more compliant and aligned with policies and legislations that can facilitate sustainable um, mechanisms around food security and the centrality of fisheries for um, securing food 
as well as nutrition and health. The current policy regimes and legislations are not um, in the best of perspectives to grow the sector and help us protect the IUU that poses a risk on food security and nutrition and livelihoods. The second point um, that was mentioned by Matthew, which I appreciate, which is this issue of institutional arrangements and the architecture of fisheries in the ecosystem of the economic uh, triggers for food security, livelihoods, employment, empowerment, and how it brings gender into that arrangement and also how these institutional arrangements are friendly to attract youth participation for employment. So I think there is quite a bit that needs to be done in revisiting and disrupting the institutional arrangement and situate it in a much more innovative way. The other is capacity. Um, the, the ways capacity and technical assistance were being unleashed to our member states over the years. I would say in my humble opinion, have not resulted in the intended purposes of why they were put together in the first place. It is not really building truly a sustainable capacity and competencies to create the, the same values of fisheries that other parts of the world have managed to benefit. If we fix the capacity and redo it in a, in, 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 in a disruptive way and make it more substantive, it will begin and build it around the value chain to rebuild and reignite the fisheries ecosystem with capacity and competences to manage IUU, I think uh, we will go a long way. Um, the MCS and operational procedures um, are very weak if they exist at all. I don't consider uh, some of these, and maybe Matthew, you may disagree with me or maybe agree with me, um, at best they don't exist. I'm just putting it rather boldly. And it's a crux of the problem, which also need to be, to be addressed. So we tend to sometimes lose, um, get into the forest and resort into self-interest or national interest when it comes to IUU, but the cost is recursive. Even those that are violating and gaining, they eventually lose. So uh, uh, this, this, uh, this lack of flexibility to reach a reasonable agreement and outcome will eventually cost the world. Because if livelihoods continue to be affected and poverty continues to elude us, it will be everybody's problem. The issue of, of, of subsidies, there's not much time to really get into it, but all this fixation on, on subsidies needs to be visited in the context of an equity. Um, uh, what it, the cost that it creates and causes far outweigh the intended purposes of these subsidies. I hope uh, I've been provocative enough as a, as a discussion. Um, my, Dominic, my mind has is, is, is been very busy uh, uh, the whole day from moderating from the GCM7, so I had to quickly come and I had a lot that I wanted to, to put together, but uh, I've taken more time than necessary. And I hope this is valuable and useful. And I thank you very much for the, for the opportunity uh, to, to participate as a discussion and appreciate both the presentations of Matthew and Alice 
and, and Daniel. I, I find them very valuable and hope you will be able to share uh, these presentations with us and hope we will have additional opportunities like this and broaden it to uh, most of our countries because I think, um, Dominic, this is a very important uh, engagement that we can benefit a lot. I, I, I just wish we had many more of them before they rise up to the MC12, but we will have MC13 coming up post MC12. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency, for your for your remark. I will definitely not try to uh, to summarize all what you said, but I think you, what is important is that you made this link to indeed uh, a big risk. IUU as a big risk to food security, livelihood, nutrition, and uh, and indeed the the importance to uh, to look to revisit the national regimes, to have the institutional arrangements, to and to to build capacity along the entire value chain to 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 manage uh, IOU. I think. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency, for also providing uh, your perspective. And uh, and uh, I know that you are so energetic at this advanced time of the week. So I wonder if would, if it would have been Monday morning. So, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. And now and now I will return to the to the the, the three speakers uh, we had today to invite their reactions. There were a number of uh, of questions that you have seen, colleagues, in the in the in, in the Q&A module. So I would invite you to take one or two of these questions and, and then but then also to uh, to react uh, in general, I think uh, to, to the three of you, uh, there was a there is a comment that has been put by Manuel Barange, the director of the fisheries and aquaculture division in, in Ecuador, uh, saying that well most of your intervention uh, actually refer to I, the illegal part of IUU fishing. And uh, do you think uh, we need to broaden the messaging to ensure unregulated and unreported fisheries are also uh, better included in our communication discussion debate? And then, uh, Matthew, uh, while you respond, please also, uh, I would encourage you to refer to the, the issue of uh, transshipment, which is also uh, where FAO is also doing a lot of work and uh, in which you could perhaps uh, elaborate a bit on. But please try to, let's say, four minutes each. Uh, and uh, and we, OK, uh, let's go the same order we started. So Mathieu, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dominique. And uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, co-presenters here. And <clears throat> thanks for all the questions that have come through. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for that uh, wonderful address. Uh, and I do agree with you <laughs> in, in all the elements that you have mentioned. Um, yes, I should um, re-emphasize uh, what, what Manuel has um, just referred to, the, the fact that you know, in my, the beginning of my presentation, that there are three components there, the illegal, the unreported, unre unregulated fishing, uh, and they all, all three need to be uh, addressed. Um, it is not acceptable to have a situation where you have an unregulated fishing because there's, uh, there's no system in place to ensure sustainability. Now, just to um, also refer to some of the questions that have been um, posed here, um, and uh, specifically whether I think that, uh, you know, trade and transparency um, would be a good tool to combat IU fishing. Uh, and um, you know, there are other, uh, other suggestions here on, on what other tools could be used for uh, you know, market measures, etc. But my answer is everything is important. The important thing is that we have the tools in the toolbox and we are going to use the right tool to address the right issue. We cannot hammer a nail into the wall with a screwdriver. We use the right tool for the right thing. Um, just a, a quick comment on the this issue of transparency, um, which is very loosely used. Um, and, and yes, of course, it's important to be transparent, but not just for the sake of it. Um, you know, uh, it, it's not about just uh, sharing you know, telephone numbers of, uh, of the crew. 
publicly around the world. That has hardly any use. What I would say, it has to be transparency with a focus. Information exchange is part of being transparent. So we may get situations where countries claim that, yes, they're open to transparency and they, they're sharing their um, the tracking of their vessels with, uh, you know, through certain initiatives, but then they are not um, registering or recording their vessels in the global record of fishing vessels. So it has to be a, a focused and effective um, transparency system. Again, one needs to break down the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing into other components. There are different issues happening there. Um, as I said, you know, the Ill illegal fishing could be something linked to organized crime. And uh, illegal fishing could be taking place because there isn't sufficient monitoring control and surveillance, uh, and therefore, you know, vessels are, are not monitored, not controlled, and they just conduct, you know, using uh, um, illegal gear just off the coast. Um, sometimes not reporting catch is also illegal because there may be a, you know, a regulation in place to report your catches. And there was also a question that was in the chat there, which I saw whether IU fishing is linked to um, other crimes. Yes, of course, indeed. Um, I didn't have enough time to address this, but um, in a nutshell, uh, IU fishing is about you know, fishing regulation, about not, um, you know, going against the sustainability rules to achieve uh, sustainable fisheries. But then you have other crimes, um, or I would say crimes, that are either directly related to fishing, for example, document fraud, the fact that there is a, uh, a forged license, a fake license, uh, or maybe the working conditions of um, the crew uh, are not decent. Those are crimes that are, of course, linked to the fishing operation directly, but don't fall under fisheries regulations. Indecent working conditions are go against labor laws. Document fraud goes under uh, other uh, regulations. And then there are also uh, crimes taking place on fishing vessels that have nothing to do with the fishing operation. Human trafficking, drug smuggling, arms smuggling, so those are um, crimes that are associated with the fishing industry. And of course, they need to be uh, tackled um, uh, separately, not by uh, the fishing, the, the fisheries agencies, uh, but through other mechanisms. In any case, uh, FAO promotes very strongly interagency coordination. Um, fishing vessels, uh, um, you know, are, are linked to various agencies, not only fisheries, there's, there's customs and there's um, you know, the Coast Guard and uh, maybe phytosanitary um, controls and the maritime agency, port authorities. What's important is that there is this interagency coordination to address these, um, these different aspects. I conclude on the issue of transshipment. Yes, this is, it's important because those engaged in IO fishing are operating in a clandestine manner. They, they're always trying to find ways and means how to you know, find the loopholes around things. And whilst something like transshipment um, could actually support sustainability, because it is, it, it could uh, help a fishery to be more profitable. Um, the fact that they would transship at sea instead of coming in and out of port, it, you know, it supports, um, uh, good fisheries management, it could also, if it is not regulated or monitored, uh, serve as um, a laundering machine for IUU caught fish. And uh, transshipment can take place in port on the high seas, etc. So, and this is why at the end of this month, um, after quite a long process of studies and uh, expert consultations, FAO is now convening a technical consultation to um, negotiate a new 
albeit voluntary, international uh, instrument to monitor, regulate, and control transshipment so that all the uh, holes that there are could be plugged. Of course, another one will uh, arise somewhere else, but we have to be ready to also um, uh, put a stop to uh, any other activity that um, could support IU fishing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Matthew. And now uh, moving to Alice. Alice, please try to be uh, short <laughs> in, your, in your response because we are nearing the end of the session. So three minutes, four minutes, Mike. I, I will be super succinct. There were two questions for me in the chat. Um, one was about uh, whether coastal states could make determinations about their own vessels. Uh, and I'll answer that briefly. The other one was whether I had any strategies or practical recommendations for mitigating IUU fishing uh, in industrial vessels or small scale fishing. And that question I will gratefully refer straight back to the FAO because they are the people to ask about that. Um, yes, under the agreement, a flag state can make a determination about a vessel flying its own flag, so its own vessel. Interestingly, this brings me to one of the little exceptions that I forgot to come back to, which is that there is a grace period in the agreement for IUU determinations made of made in small scale, so resource poor, low income fishing within the territorial sea. The subsidy prohibition applies to those determinations, but it cannot be enforced for two years. So that's the flexibility for that specific amount of fishing or that specific kind of fishing. Um, one last point to make, the WTO agreement does not define or decide what is or is not IUU fishing. That is entirely up to the coastal state or the flag state or the RFMO. And here I link back just briefly to Manuel's question um, because essentially it is for the government to decide when either illegal or unreported or even unregulated fishing under the IPOA description under paragraph three, when that reaches a degree of severity that it justifies a subsidy withdrawal. So it is very much for the government to decide when an infringement becomes serious enough that it warrants subsidy withdrawal. Nothing in the WTO agreement defines how that decision should be made. That's entirely the sovereign jurisdiction of the state, but all three ideas are covered. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Alice. Very clear, very precise. Thank you so much. Uh, and now let me move to Daniel. Daniel, any comments on your side? Yes, and, and thank you very much for the questions. I will start with the, with the last one covered already uh, by Alice. Uh, and it's actually the, the question by uh, Mr. Manuel Barange. Um, so here in the slide, uh, at the bottom, you can see the difference between illegal, uh, unreported and unregulated. It is true that it's up to the government uh, to decide the, the, the definition, but you, we can see uh, several offenses like uh, no nationality or jeopardizing uh, uh, the fish stocks, etc. So I think, um, yes, uh, they are pretty much linked and, and we should broaden uh, the discussion, but Again, and as, uh, as, as Alice uh, mentioned, it all depends on the gravity of the, of the infraction. I mean, uh, not because you are uh, making a mistake on the reporting uh, to sort of a specific species, you should be considered as a, as a criminal. And this links to the criminality. Uh, well, when, when we talk about the IU, we're talking about environmental um, infringements. So uh, when we talk about uh, human trafficking, et cetera, yes, they may be related, but uh, considering uh, um, um, environmental uh, infringement as, as uh, environmental crimes or offenses, again, it depends on the uh, on the uh, on the gravity, and uh, sometimes they are related, yes, to to other offenses like uh, it was mentioned on the uh, labor abuse. Uh, we saw that in in many cases, in for instance, in in Asian countries. Um, but again, I think uh, we should a uh, little bit differentiate. And then there was a, a question not addressed by anyone about uh, eco-labeling and how that could be, that could be uh, uh, a driver for, uh, for tackling IEU. I, I do agree that eco-labeling is doing a lot of good in, in many regions. Uh, companies that want to do better, they, they try to do these uh, fisheries improvement pro programs, for instance, and, and, and implement full traceability, transparency in the fishery and doing the right things. Etc. But the thing is that those who don't do not want to comply with the rules, they will not seek the assistance of the assistance of uh, of the of the labeling. 
of the labels. So uh, yes, is is one tool in the in the toolbox, and I think is is really useful and and actually can reassure the consumer that what he is consuming, he or she is consuming, is not only legal but but uh, sustainable. But I, I think here uh, we need a whole legislative framework supported by the governments and regional and international authorities to make sure that what is happening at sea is, is, is regulated, controlled and monitored. And uh, so I think there's, there's a role to play by uh, eco-labeling, uh, sorry, eco-labels, but, uh, but that cannot hamper the role of the governments in controlling the, the fishing fleets and the fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. We have now reached the, the end of our, our session today. I would like to thank you, Excellencies and colleagues for, for your participation. A big thank also, of course, goes to our uh, speakers today for, for their, their comprehensive presentations and their remarks and their uh, provoking uh, remarks. Uh, we had 80 per participants today. Uh, we had a lot of questions, reactions. Uh, to my mind, this shows the, the relevance of the topic, uh, the importance of the topic. And, uh, you know, this was done in the context of the FAO in Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. And I wonder if moving forward, we should not rename that Agricultural and Fisheries uh, Trade Talks. And this is something that we, will be, uh, that we will be discussing. But I see a lot of interest. And thank you also, uh, Ambassador Ka, for giving us some of the, the ideas on uh, on, on, on the importance of that, and also for, for referring to the, the work that is done by, by the FAO itself. And, uh, and FAO, uh, within its mandate, of course, uh, being working on technical advice, on the development of uh, international instruments, as was mentioned by, uh, by Matthew, but also in terms of information and, uh, and evidence building. We didn't refer, I think, to the SOFIA, the state of food, uh, the of fisheries and, uh, and, and aquaculture, which, such, which is such a, so an important document. But FAO also is a forum for discussion and a key player in, uh, in capacity development. So we will come back. We will come back to, to you on the topic of fisheries. Uh, we'll reflect with our colleagues from the fisheries and aquaculture uh, division, of course, engaging with you, our partners, and see how we can conceive a, a, a series of structured dialogue on the topic. Uh, with that, I thank you very much, and I wish you all a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.